Yes, that. There we go. That should work. Hey, Uncle Matt. <laughs> Uncle Matt. When did I become Uncle Matt? You know what I think is pretty funny is I told my, uh, like, since I had my son, all my siblings are now, like, aunts and uncles, right? So then I'm sure that hit home for a couple of them. Mucky Monkey, Fast Lane, Tony, DW, Eddie, Clearview. Working on 4th of July. I know. What an a-hole for a boss, right? God, it got me working on the 4th. <laughs> so last week I had two different days. See, the thing about holidays for me is, like, unless I have anything significant planned, for the most part, they're another day. But the way that I run my schedule right now is when I don't have a car coming in for the day, I'll either make a video or sometimes we'll just do other family stuff that day. So I have, I have plenty of other, other days. Um, and then I scheduled a windshield this morning and I was like, well, I might as well make a day out of it. So I did a windshield this morning in ceramic, which was cool. Um, and now we're doing, we're doing this one. Uh, Pack, Pack Pime? Lionel, Mr. Liberty. I gotta stop reading names because I can't pronounce everything. Eddie, what's up? I got a car scheduled for tomorrow on Wednesday. Girlfriend, girlfriend wanted me to have the day off for her. <laughs> well, you gotta put in those personal days. That's one reason I, I really like the way that I set this up, is I can schedule those days. But also, I, I always try and keep it in mind. This is what happened. Anytime you have a slow day, try and take advantage of it as, as a personal day if you can. Or get some extra stuff done. Daniel Reyna whipping in here. Daniel Reyna <laughs> super chatted $9.99. What you're working today. Tell your boss he's fired. Long. Tell your boss he's fired. All right, guys, that's it. We're done for today. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for the 10. Geo Shield 70 ceramic. Uh, da -da. Geo Shield 70% ceramic is also advised with flat glass. In Netherlands, we have another brand, 70% not advised with flash scrap. What's up with that? Okay, so uh, I don't know. I kind of glossed through that comment. GeoShield 70% ceramic is also advised with flat glass. In the Netherlands, we have another brand, 70% ceramic, not advised on flat glass. I don't know. I would talk to the individual companies and ask them why. Uh, when I talk to Geo, it's, it's actually, I got this confused. I thought for the longest time it was the adhesive. Um, the problem with certain films and flat glass is heat absorption. So you can only absorb so much heat into the glass before it causes it to crack. And that's why there's a lot of reflective architectural film. So you need to reflect that heat away from the glass because thermal expansion causes, causes it to crack. Um, why 170 over another? I, I'm not sure. It has to do with heat absorption. Just found out Geo is based in Louisiana. That's my home state. Yeah, they fight. Uh, they fight hurricanes all the time. <laughs> they. I give them lots of props. You too, man. Holy shit! I remember getting some pictures. It was just everything's flooded, and I'm like, oh god, I don't want to be there. Uh, they can both be 70s. Yep, yep. Like Burner says, they can both be 70, but it comes down to the performance, how much energy they absorb. Yep, and also what the company is willing to warranty. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, yep, yep. What was that from? I feel like that was a, that was a Muppets thing. Yep, 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 yep. I did my bedroom in 5%. My mom was like, no way, take it off too dark. Your bedroom's too dark. Your mom called it. That's hilarious. Okay, are we good? All right, let's get started. 
She wasn't a fan of the five percent. Yeah, um, I gotta tint some how my house windows here pretty soon, um, and I'm gonna have to figure out what to put on that. If I bring you a vehicle, will I get a Fourth of July discount? Swedish Chef, that's it. That's it. That's the. Uh, um, well, he's the. And then uh, I think the little aliens that zoomed in, right? Yep, 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 yep. No, no holiday discounts, unfortunately. You know, this guy said he brought in this car. He found me from my YouTube short. The silly one where I do the legal. Uh, I cut the top inch of, off the film and do the tint meter. He found my channel that way, and now, now he brought his car in. That's kind of awesome. Those little aliens, those didn't pop in on the, the Swedish ship. <laughs> Beaker. Aren't the, weren't the Muppets awesome? That was one of our favorite things growing up. We weren't allowed to watch a lot of things growing up, but we could watch the Muppets. Can you stream when you tint the house windows? No, I don't think so. Maybe. Sure, why not? No. <laughs> See, what I'm probably going to end up doing is I'm going to tint them as like an auto tinner would tint them. That's not... That's not um, the best way to do that. So I actually don't have any uh, flat glass training. So what I might do is see whatever videos are out there and then just try and do that, but then make a video video on it. I don't have a plan. I just know I have to. So I have no idea what film I'm even going to use yet. I'm like completely green when it comes to flat. <laughs> I don't know how to do flat, but people keep asking me to do it, so I keep doing it. <laughs> That's kind of awesome. Then you get good at it. The thing is, I'll do them on my own house, and then if somebody asks me to do them on theirs, I'm gonna have to politely decline. I don't wanna be, I don't wanna do flat glass. I have enough here. But you can make good money doing it. So like, the, the hard part for me is mixing auto and flat glass and the channel together. So I would basically just do flat outside of it. But again, I'm starting to create work that I don't want to ever do. I would have to find somebody to take care of the flat glass. Oh, so our Black Magic video, the title totally bombed. It didn't fix it. I tried something else this morning. It's slightly disingenuous to the video, but we're throwing stuff at it. Why is he masking the inner seal? So um, this one in particular has felt on it. So that's just kind of a happy coincidence. It's also a little dirty, um, but whenever you mask off the inside seals. It's essentially like putting a brand new seal on a car. It just keeps your sides cleaner. So I use house wrap tape. I sneak it into the seals, you know, about a half inch or whatever. You know, just cover up that inside there and then wrap it. Wrap it along the panel. We're really just trying to sneak part of it in cover up that felt. It gives us room to make mistakes. That's what this really does. 
Uh, would you recommend V Nano or go with Pro Nano Apex? Um, I just use Pro Nano right now. V Nano is an economic ceramic, so it'll save you a little bit of money on buying a roll. But again, it comes at the cost of some clarity. It also, yeah, as somebody said in chat, it's got a five year warranty. Yeah, Apex is gonna be their top tier, top tier ceramic. Blacks out 95 IR. I'm still playing around with it though. Do you not carry it? Um, I, I will once I'm done playing around with it first. Even with Geo, it doesn't matter. Any company, if I'm gonna carry their film, I'm gonna, I'm gonna test it out before I offer it. And once I'm happy with the film, then I, then I offer it. What's the tape you use on the back glass and the windshields? Glass Aid. There, I even got you a link. I have Apex on my whole car. It's amazing in this Cali heat. Yeah, the heat rejection is awesome on it. <laughs> Test the film out on my cars. If you sign up for a class. It's funny, a lot of the a lot of students come with their cars already tinted. We've only ended up tinting, like we made sure the last day, um, one of them brought in a MK, MKZ. We had it tinted in carbon with a full windshield by the end of the day. But I can only throw so much uh, other films at cars. <laughs> but it was nice. They sent um, they sent some carbon for the last class. But yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't think I'm gonna have a, a huge demand for where I'm gonna where I'm gonna place Apex, which is one reason I'm not, I haven't rushed it either. So I've got, I've got car, uh, dyed carbon and ceramic, which is a pretty compre comprehensive um, like upgrade path. So you have, like I said, dyed carbon ceramic and then Apex, um, would basically slot in there as a super ceramic. So when I get those uh, inquiries basically for like, they just already wanna go out with all ceramic, then I would probably add that into my proposal or I might, I don't know, I might just add them into all of them. But I don't wanna make it super confusing. But Apex would be way up there on, on pricing. I think these are little sap nuggets. Um, oh, glass aid on the corners. So yeah, if you wipe it, if you wipe your windows off with a towel, especially in the summertime when the glass is warmer, um, glass aid doesn't stick to corners super well, especially because when you're pulling it, it stretches. So you have to let it relax a little bit. But when you're running rounding corners and stuff, yeah, just try and let let it relax. And ahead of time, 
That's why you always see me scrub off a back window and squeegee it. Squeegeeing a back window has been the most consistent thing for getting this stuff to stick and not let go. I'm 700 for a full windshield with ceramic. Nice. Me too. So Apex with the full windshield is probably going to be right around a thousand. Mike Hobbs super chatted two dollars. Yeah, that's kind of that's where you're going up to though, like. Apex is meant to compete with uh, with the likes of like XR Plus. I don't know any other. What's another one? Solar FX has one. There's a handful of like the 95 IRs that people call super ceramics. I like the category. I think it's cool. 650 on the sides. 350 on the shield. Yeah, something like that. It's kind of like an FU price for film. Again, it's like it's that top tier where somebody's just like, I want the best that you can possibly carry. And like with a lot of categories, like is it is it better? Yeah, it is. It'll be the best of everything. Doesn't mean you don't get a good film, a very good film out of Pro Nano. It just means you can get a little bit better. And for some people, that's what it is. Oh, but there was a super chat that I missed, wasn't there? Mike Hobbs with the two. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. But yeah, I probably have people that, that would want it that would have wanted it. But I throw it on my stuff, and when I'm happy with it, then I get it. Mixed reviews on Flex. Yeah. Are there any geo importers to Europe in the house? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think so. Geo is one of those, uh, those kind of like in between. They're growing pretty rapidly, but they are still US based. Carbon. This is unopened. Do I have a five percent that's that's open? Do you oh I've got a really clear picture of this though. Somebody asked, do you um Add another tier, or do you drop the dyed film? Oh, it's right here. Okay. I just had it sitting right there. I thought I had an opened roll. Um, you don't get rid of the, I, at least for me, I don't get rid of the dyed tier. Part of it is keeping clear, um, a very clear reason why you would want one film over the next. So if you want, when you do like a good, better, best system, it makes it really clear what your mid-grade is, and I want to keep that. That's why I'm a little hesitant on adding a, adding a fourth. 
but it's so far up there, I don't think I'm even going to hardly talk about it in every conversation. If somebody right off the bat is trying to decide between diet and carbon, then like I can bring up the fact that I have a very expensive ceramic, but they're not that, they're not that customer. But in, in, in the world of, of window film, when you have a dyed film, a carbon and ceramic, it makes it really, like, like I said, I'm probably repeating myself, makes it really clear what the upgrade is. When you're starting out with 50% heat rejection on there, and then you're adding 75, 80, and then 95, you've got that kind of diminishing return. It's like, well, I'm already getting some heat rejection with the standard. It blurries, it blurries that line a little bit. That's why you see Apple still offer like a insufferable amount of storage on their base model tablets. Like how long were they offering 32 gigs of storage on their base model tablets? It's like, ah, oh, well, I guess I just got to spend the extra and, and upgrade that. They know what they're doing. Could they offer 64, 128 right off the bat? Sure, absolutely. But what's going to get you to go to the, ne the next tier? One of the biggest things that you're ever going to use, like, and they put the fastest processors in them anyways. It's because people understand what they actually use. So when you start muddying that water a little bit, it confuses people. So just make it very, whatever you do as far as your lineup goes, just make it very clear why somebody's getting one over the, over the next, whether that be how you talk about something or the actual value prop. Because here, you know, we got winners six months out of the year. <laughs> Winter six months out of the year, people are not buying their summer clothes unless they're really smart in the winter time. So there are people that still get carbon and ceramic in the winter time. It's just not at the front of their mind. So that's one reason I'm gonna kind of keep things the way it is and then add as I see appropriate. <sighs> Let's see. There was somebody that said, uh, what's your thoughts on an employee working at your shop during the day and then after work going to work for the competition? We just fired an employer for this. He learned to tint from us. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't blame your shop for it. Would it. However you feel about it is however you feel about it. Um, what you're going to find from, from people in general is like ambitious people, especially tinters, like a lot of them want to be business owners and they want to make as much as they can and unfortunately the hard look at it is he wasn't able to make everything that he wanted to at your shop that's why he went to a different shop so I, I totally get being upset about it um, I've worked with some people that felt that way and then also worked with like seen the, the complete other side of it if they want to make money in their spare time, then what they do in their spare time is, is really not much of my business. As long as they come in and they do their job, I'm, I'm going to keep them on. But where it gets really tough is definitely going to be like, you know, when they're tending for your shop and then they want to make their own shop on the side. And then you know that they're going to leave because you, you just, that's a train wreck waiting to happen, right? Like, you know, they're going to leave. So then you got to do your best to then find the replacement. So I don't know. It's tough to tough to say what the right call is, but you know, having good growth opportunities for people I think is really important in this business and very very overlooked because there's a lot of people like you know, they're they're making good money at the shop, but then you hit that cap and you want to grow past it. 
So figuring out how to work with somebody past that, I think, is a big hurdle. Not hardly any shops have managed to do. They all see it from like, well, he's making good money. This is what he makes a year. Well, eventually he's going to want his own retirement too. I mean, people see that I think more clearly now, early on than, than ever. So if you, you have one shop, you got to focus on maybe getting two, <laughs> put them in charge of it, and let them grow their own team, and and move on from that. Like, I don't know. I don't have the best answer for it. But I know that's what happened to me. I was making good money. I was happy. But you always hit that cap, and you just want to keep going. Try to, I don't know, try and get a message to, uh, to Rick if you're having some distributing problems. That sucks. Of course, it happens on the... Uh, on a holiday. <laughs> he might be he might be uh off roading his Jeep though. Plotters are not exact, it's good for back windows and quarter windows. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the software. I've been really happy with uh, with film cut for back glass and quarters. I made a couple of adjustments on the plotter. I gotta I gotta try it on doors a little bit more. But I wouldn't be doing it whether or not it, if it was like damn near spot on every time. I'd probably still be hand cutting door windows. That's kind of part of the thing here. I tried to load in some zooms though. I want to get a plotter to help get through cars. What do you recommend where to start my research? Plotter software. Check out um check out plotter depot. Plotter Depot's got a lot of plotters listed. They also have a couple of software options, too. We may even use it on this back window, but it's already, it's already covered. It's already ready to go, so maybe I won't. <sighs> Depends on whose kits you use. So yeah, open up the plotter can of worms again. <laughs> the the best that I ever used was uh, Xpel software. The problem was always quality control. So you got to look at plotters like from most of them are gonna cut great patterns, but then it's up to the software to give the plotter great patterns to cut. So if the software pattern is good, the pattern will be good. That depends entirely on whoever put that pattern in that database. And so you can have one car go very well and you can have one car go very poorly on the exact same software. I don't think there's a perfect software out there, but one reason I'll at least mention FilmCut is because I hear they have good quality control. 
and I've been pretty happy with the back windows and the quarter windows. There's just some cuts on the on the door windows that I always feel like I have to go in and touch up, but that's been with so many softwares. So it depends on what type of business that you're running. If you are very particular about your cuts, then a plotter is generally not gonna be your best asset. What a plotter is gonna do well is essentially it's like hiring an entry level employee to cut your windows and whatever they give you is whatever they give you. That's as far as that goes. So high production all day long. But again, like you're talking about little nuance, like some of them are little nuances, some of them turn out to be bigger deals, but as a whole, that machine is gonna speed you up but you gotta learn to live with the quirk. So if the pattern's not as perfect as you wanna get, you still got the car done. At the shop I was at, every time I got a pattern screwed, it was my fault, even if I was watching the plotter and standing right there, like, okay, I didn't use the plotter regularly, but come on. There's a, I mean, I worked with a lot of, a lot of shops and people when we cut stuff out and there's something that was subpar, it's kinda like, well, we got other cars to do. And then you move on to the next car. But when you when you work with other companies, you you start to learn more what the norm is. So you might think like, "Oh, every shop is so careful and so particular." No. There's a lot of them that are very much just about Getting stuff in, getting it out, moving on to the next job, because that's how they make the most money. They just quick turnover. And in their head, like, oh yeah, we're using software. The software, so that pattern is not my fault. Or, well, that's what the pattern did. Some people don't take the time to fix it. Again, you're talking about like so many little differences from so many shops and there's some, there's some great people out there and there's some real shitty ones. Plotters, I don't know, I, it seems to be a really hard thing to really get across to people because it's like, which plotter should I get? Well. That matters less and less nowadays. It's more about which software should you get for that plotter. And unfortunately, there's not an abundance of amazing options. It's not like, it's not like you can buy There we go. It's not like you can buy um, the window diagrams and then get your patterns that way. That's not what happens. It's very much somebody sends in patterns or the company takes it upon themselves to get the car and then, you know, figure it out themselves that way and then scan it. Scan it on a big scanning machine and then create an AI file with it. And then at that point, they should reprint it and install it and see how that looks. But then they got people bugging them about, about, about cars. Like, hey, why don't you have this one? And just kick it up. They always blamed <laughs> I was being blamed on me. They wanted to start the, the settings being changed constantly between tint and PPF. <laughs> Stops are funny to work for. Sometimes you get good ones, but there's a lot of bad ones out there too. So what I've learned, when you have multiple people running a plotter, 
there's one person that really knows how to run that plotter very well, and everybody else just fucks it up. I can't tell you how many times I would take a day off, I would come back in, and there would be an, like, one time there was an out of order sign on the plotter. And then there were, like, so there would be other people, too, that would cut out patterns ahead of times for the tinners to help things move faster. But when you're only half into using that plotter, again, it doesn't matter if it's a workhorse or a graph tech, you're going to do so many dumb little mistakes and just screw up that whole machine. And then that tinner's got to sit there and mess with it until they fix it again. Plotter is very much like a train. As soon as it goes, it derails, it's a bitch to put it back on the tracks again. But when it's running, just don't mess with it and you'll be okay. So when you get it in the state of like, ah, it's working well enough, <laughs> but it could be better, you always take that little risk there and then you end up screwing it up or you might screw it up worse. So I've got an older blade in that, and I want to switch it out with the, with the red box blade. But I'm going to have to go through all the same pains again, and sometimes I just don't like to. Yep. It's funny listening to some of you guys finally get in with the shop and talk about these headaches. That's what I've been dealing with. Like, that's what we all deal with. My boss would come and cut something out and be all messed up and he'd blame it on me. <laughs> yeah, um, so it should be as simple as you take the blade, uh, the blade holder out, you put the other one in, you press your settings, you switch it over to PPF, and then you cut PPF, and then you switch the settings back and put it in. I don't know. Plotters are super touchy, though. So just anytime you screw with it, it's just not going to work right for both. <laughs> it can, and it should. <laughs> but inevitably, something goes wrong, especially with the tint side of it. What was the story again? I'm working in a shop with dust. So it depends on the shop. I was surprised nobody seemed to mention it. On Saturday, uh, we were working on a Tesla, and um, my my new hire he was uh, he was patching the walls and sanding there, and he was sanding there. I didn't say anything about it, and the job went really well. The problem is when a lot of that stuff starts getting kicked into the air. So he asked about a vacuum, and I told him not to use a vacuum because the vacuum is going to start blowing a bunch of air and kicking dust into the air. Um, you got to give stuff a chance to settle, or you got to be kind of walled off from wherever the action is happening. So there's certain things, like ceiling fans, if anything's above me for a ceiling fan that's going to try and blow my tin off the car, shut that off. If there's a garage door open and it's blowing in a cross breeze and you can like feel the wind coming in, I'll close it all the way, if not most of the way. And then if there's somebody that's like, like detailing stuff, when they're wheeling cars, when they're using air guns, that stuff, like there's little fibers coming off of the coughing, coming off of the wheels, like the Sorry, there was another message there. How do I get in touch with Geo? Call them. Nobody is responding to my email because I'm interested in drop shipping film. I do almost 800 cars a year. I'm not sure. 
Uh, best I can say is call them. <laughs> They're closed today, though. They're closed for the 4th, so all the orders are going to ship out tomorrow. And they're, it's going to be super busy tomorrow, but I'd call them. Call them during normal times. You'll get somebody. They might just think it sounds super sketchy. Unfortunately. But they have some international clients, so... They've got, like, a couple full dealers in somewhere in the Middle East. They have some kick-ass shops. Way better looking than mine. That's for sure. Okay, but, but as far as dust goes, if you look up at some lights and you can't really see dust floating around, like, you're fine. Actually, for the most part, you're fine. It's the really offensive stuff, like air guns, pressure washers, things that move a lot of air will start kicking up stuff and make it float over your way. So if that's the case, then you need to um, kind of be sectioned off for them or do your applications when they're not doing their thing. So when I tinted at a glass shop, I would cut, prep all my windows, get them ready to install, and then I always squeegee off every window right before I go to install it. And so if they were using an air gun or something, I'd just wait for them to be done with it. Or I'd say like, hey, I'm gonna install this. Can you hold off on doing that for a minute? Or when somebody's gonna sweep the floor, because that kicks up a bunch of dirt too. I'm like, hey, can you not do that while I'm tinting? You can do it after though, sorry. Like you figure out a way to work together and if you can't, then you just can't tint there. It doesn't make sense. So that would happen with quite a few body shops. One of the worst tin shops, and I was just like, so we get sent, whenever I get, got sent to like a body shop, I was just like, oh great, here we go again. Because they'll be on the other side of the shop, but it's all fine dust stuff. Like they're sanding down bumpers and shit. And then they're just taking their air guns and <laughs> I was working on an employee's car. So this was the first time we were there. And I told them, I'm like, this isn't going to turn out very good with all this shit going on right now. Like, it's just kind of how it is. And they're like, okay, that's fine. Just do the best you can. All right. Then this guy, like, I'm on the driver's door. And this guy pulls up a van, like, right to maybe like five feet away from the door and he takes an air gun and just blows it straight at me. And I just kind of laughed because <laughs> when I squeegeed out that window, it just was, was just like, oh, it just felt terrible. It was so gritty. I didn't yell at him or anything. I just, that was the window. I told them ahead of time, like, this isn't going to turn out well. Yeah, do it anyways. All right, well, there you go. <laughs> I did the best I could. That is what they paid me to do. Was I happy about it? No, not really. It was like comically terrible though. I think that was probably the worst job ever. But that's how some of these places then start to learn too. They see the terrible job and then you go, yeah, remember when I told you it would turn out terrible because of all the dust and stuff? And they're like, yeah. That's, that's what I mean. They're like, oh, I get it now. Mm-hmm. Good job. One of the, one of my last days, or la I don't remember, it was near the end of when I was at Symbol. I would always tell them, like, removals are super frustrating, and they take a lot of time. Some of them are okay. Some of them are really, really bad. And then this one day, he's got a Crown Vic, First thing in the morning, and he's got like three more cars for me to tint. I'm like, you're kidding me, right? And he's like, what? I was like, you got a removal on a Crown Vic, which is already not the most fun car to tint. But when you put removal and Crown Vic together, do you think that they really took care of a Crown Vic? No, it's some POS car that has super old bubbly purple tint on it. I can guarantee it. Sure enough, that's what it had. 
the he he chipped in on doing some of the removal on the back window, and he got about like 15 minutes into it, and he's just like, "Wow, this really sucks." I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah, no shit." <laughs> I'm glad you finally realize it after 15 years of having a tent program. <laughs> Those are the cars that come in at 4.30 when you close it at 5, 100%. It's because they literally just got a paycheck. And now they've got that money burning a hole in their pocket and it's time to get it tinted. Should I get my car fixed? No, we're gonna get it tinted. But hey, I appreciate that too on some level. Like, if you're gonna spend money, I prefer you spending it with me, but I mean, yeah, I want your car to work. There was one guy with some failed brakes that I definitely wanted him to fix ahead of giving it to me because he didn't tell me about it. I damn near drove it through the garage door. I was so close. I was so pissed too. I don't think I've ever yelled at a customer. I straight up yelled at him for that shit. That was horrible. <laughs> Dude, your fucking brakes don't work. Oh, yeah, I need to get them fixed. <laughs> well, if you're gonna give the keys to somebody, don't you wanna mention that? God, that was, that made me real mad. Because what would have happened, it's like I wouldn't have cared about driving his car through the garage door. I would have been really upset at trying, at the company literally trying to foot me with the bill for driving the car through the garage door. That somehow would have been my fault. When you, when you cater to a lower, lower price point, you get a lot more of that and it's terrible. They never tell you when something's wrong with their car and then try and blame you. <laughs> yeah, I remember this Denali that I had. Oh, that shit was, oh, it was falling apart. It was terrible. Like you go to, I go to turn the, the lights off and it has that like knob to turn the automatic lights off and it literally fell into the dash. <laughs> like, oh, okay. And the whole thing's just kind of like hobbling into the garage. It was the funniest thing though. So I tint just the doors, just the four doors, nothing on the back. And they had factory on the rear. So we put like 20 over the rear doors, 20 on the front doors, something like that. And it's just this mismatched, weird looking piece of garbage. And then they pull it outside on the main road like they get their car, they get in it, they pull it out, and they literally do it. You right back, and then they go right up front, and they're like, "Yeah, my car is so messed up now. What happened?" <laughs> the owner was just like, looked at me, and he was like, "Ed, eh, you can take off. That's fine. I deal with this shit all the time." I was like, "Okay." I was out in uh, in Hazel Park for that one. Yeah, it's really terrible. What is the MMM? Oh, I don't know. It only comes across as one. There. They're gone now, so. It didn't even come through like a bad message or anything. It was just like one letter for me. Weird. But anyways. Yeah, there's some there's some really gross jobs. I haven't done anything bad in a in a long time. The occasional like horrific removal. But again, they're really not that bad. But pricing gets rid of all those problems. So whenever somebody calls with a Crown Vic and I say 350 and up, like which honestly is not terrible, 
they usually just, they're like, oh, okay, I'm gonna look around. Because nobody with that car is actually looking to spend money on it. Because there's plenty of those cars where, you know, you saved money on even buying the car. It hasn't been made in a long time. Nobody really took care about them. No, nobody really took care of them. And so everybody wants a deal on it. And that's fair. Like, I wouldn't spend high-end prices for shit on the Altima that I have for the class. Like, it's a POS car. That's what it's for. <laughs> it's, for it's for new tinners to hack up. Go nuts. There, there can be that kinds of stuff. The funny thing is when you want to treat something like that like it's a million bucks. It's not. Did you need to get any other licenses other than a business license? Uh, no. No, and honestly, nobody's going to come knocking on your door from day one checking if you have a business license. What a business license really helps you do is then get a business bank account and start separating your assets. But again, this is like for things that are not likely to happen, especially in the beginning. Not unless you're, uh, you're super special and you light a car on fire and it burns to the ground. Then you're in some deep, you're in some deep trouble. But you literally can start tinting as a business tomorrow. And then just work on all that stuff. Like, it's not, it's really not a big deal. I went through LegalZoom, and it cost me, like, I think $600 through them. And I've heard you can just do it for much cheaper. I just, again, time. I didn't know what I was doing. So here, here's my info. Do it for me. That's what they're for. But yeah, literally having a legitimate business is is a meme. Like it's it's very simple. I think the only thing that I really used it for was to get a business bank account. <laughs> like cause most people are not asking for you get a, what is called an EIN. So that's your business tax ID. So the only people that really want to know that is like the bank and the government. And me and and when you decide to inevitably buy something with your business on credit or something. Something like that. I don't know. Somebody's going to tell me a couple other things. But there isn't much practically and you just feel better about having it. Um I did mine for 125, 100 for L uh, LAZ and 25 for vendor number. Nice. Is that LLC, I think? Yeah, if you like, you can, you can YouTube all this stuff too, like how do I do this? Or they'll have forms that you're supposed to fill out. So anybody that takes advantage of an actual service that does it for you, you're paying a premium just to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row. But Again, what's going to happen is maybe someday somebody's going to walk around, see your business, and go like, oh, you need this proper paperwork, or you can't operate as a business. And then you go, oh, I'm so sorry about that. And then you, you go do that paperwork. The government's supposed to like small business, mostly because they can charge you money. So all those things are set up to get little fees. How much do you charge to remove tint? On the sides and the back, I just start at 250. I don't even think that's enough for the amount of time a lot of those take me. 
but I hardly get them. So I'm put in this weird position too, because somebody will inevitably watch the channel because they have bad tin or something. They'll see how to remove it, and they'll be like, oh, I'll have him do it. And then they'll call me and be like, hey, I saw your channel, love it. Can you remove my tint too? And I'm like, <laughs> I guess so. I don't want to, but I will. But that's when I feel bad too. But I'm also mad at those people too, because those are the people that bring a car, like go buy a car from Florida, where it had its windows tinted for a hundred bucks and then it's baked out in the sun for five years. And then they bring it up here and they're like, hey, come on, Matt, take it off. <laughs> I'm like, I hate you. But also thank you for the business and bringing it in and watching my channel. I like those things. It just, I wish you removed it yourself. <laughs> That's the honest truth about it. Because removals suck. Removals suck for anybody. They suck for the customer. They suck for the installer. I can do a removal and then still have problems wrong with the job. So then I have to redo it. Yeah, I've never just quoted like an hourly number for it. I, I've just kind of, sometimes I'll ask for a picture or something or just ask how bad it is. And if they say bubbled anything, then it's like, oh yeah, this isn't gonna be super fun to remove. As long as you can get the film off, the glue can be taken care of. But just because you can get the film off doesn't mean the glue is gonna be easy, but at least it's more like possible. You guys down south especially have it really bad because you have a bunch of bunch more competition, bunch of cheap shops. And it gets way hotter down south and it it really bakes tint. I've been charging really cheap to remove tint. Well, the way that I look at it at this point was I I we were charging a lot of the times for all the sides and rear 160 and it didn't really matter the state of it. It was just, you know, we didn't get that many removals, 160. It adds, like what I hate about it is it adds so much to the price of the job that you're like, ah, well, you know, adding another 250 to get your car tinted is just gonna make everybody or make more people not get the high end stuff because of how expensive it is. It is. I would much rather just get a car untinted and do ceramic than charge the same amount with the removal. It just sucks for everybody. But yeah, most of the time it was, it was 160, um, but you have other help in a shop. So you can, like what we would do is the guy that's prepping tint, we would also have him remove it. Because if you can pay somebody 15 bucks an hour to remove tint, then it doesn't suck as much. The problem is when you have the guy that does all the things that make the money for the business also doing what could be done by basically anybody, that's when it really doesn't make sense. So if I have somebody else do it, I could, in theory, just charge less to do it. But I'm looking at, oh, in the, in the time that I can do a removal, I could also tint two cars. That sucks. But you can also look at it this way too. When you start charging more for your removals, you're charging like you don't wanna do them which is true, you don't, you don't wanna do them. And then when you get a removal, it's all of a sudden like, oh, hey, I got a bunch more money to do this. Now I'm, now it's definitely worth my time to do as long as you, as long as you make it that way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. A lot of people saying the longer you stay with low pricing, the harder it is to increase. Mm hmm That's unfortunate, yep. Because what happens, um, what happens on your pricing early on 
is it sets the tone for your business. You are attracting those people at that particular price. They will refer people based on that price, tell their friends what they got, and then you dig yourself into, into a particular hole. What you find is in the beginning, a lot of people are giving you an opportunity to sit their car because they're looking for cheap and convenient. It takes more work. It takes a lot more work to earn better business because there's already places that exist that is catering to that in, in a lot of cases. So what you have to do is then stand out. The easiest way to stand out is always with price. Are you the cheapest and the most convenient? Okay, cool, you got my business. But you gotta do something different to attract better business. I learned that the, uh, the hard way. <laughs> like I heard some of that earlier on but it's really apparent when you work with a lot of companies and shops and, and people. Call around, ask pricing, and charge what you think you're worth. I, yes, and like I, I do agree with, with that. Like it's healthy to call around and see what other people are charging so you have like a broad understanding of what other people are being told. And then you gotta have a real objective look at your own business and go, okay, what things am I putting out there that is clearly different, better, or more interesting than other business around me? Most people are doing exactly what their competitors are doing, and that's in this day and age, you're posting some pictures on your social media, you're maybe offering a special or two, and you're waiting for referrals from people that you've done existing business for. You always gotta think outside whatever the current box is. One thing I like about this channel too is I've actually tinted for a lot of people that have never gotten tint before. So it's not with everybody, but every once in a while I've got somebody, like I, always, I, I make it a point to ask most people, like have you had tint before? So when you're talking to them up front, it can kind of change your tone a little bit or change what you usually say. Like if somebody has window tint before, okay, you've already been through this. What did you have on your last vehicle? What shades are you looking for? These are the different types of film. Like you've, you've kind of been through that process. You know what to expect. When somebody has never had tint before, it's just everything that you're saying is can be completely new. Well, often is new, but also depends on what kind of information that they had ahead of time. So if you have uh, info on your website or YouTube channel or, or whatever else, like people have a chance to learn about you before they come in. That's often why I tend to get people that have never had tint before too, is because it's hot outside, hey, why not get some window tint? Or I just got a new car. I know nothing about tint. And then you come across somebody on YouTube talking a lot about window tint. And oh, I happen to be in the area. Where else would I go? <sighs> I used the triage in the correct way doing a Subaru the other day and what a difference. <laughs> Yes, so there are, this is the tool. There are three sides to this. I use this on damn near every, every window that I install, like every door window. Um, this side and this side, like it's, it's the same on both sides of the, of the card. Like this is the smooth beveled side. And then there's this like flattened edge side. Don't use the flattened edge side. All it does is help add some structure to the card. I didn't realize so many people, when they pick it up, they naturally pick it up like this and start doing that. Don't do that.
But yeah, there's there's some cards that you can use every side on. The Triage is not one of them. The Triage X. Why won't they bevel the straight side? I don't know, because this is what the mold is. <laughs> it's got to redo probably a $30,000 mold to make that change. It also still says patent pending on it. So maybe at this point they could update it. I'll, I'll if I if I call him, he will he will definitely tell me exactly why it is the way it is, and we will go on for probably about a half an hour about it. Hey, good idea on using the door panel protector from the front to the back. Never thought about that. The only reason I don't do it most of the time is that it can still get wet underneath a little bit. So pulling it from one side to the back door, um, you know, it just depends on how much water, like whenever you lift it, especially water then seeps right under. So I sometimes we'll just grab it from one to the next, but yeah, I usually just do four sheets if, if not. I had a green triad scratch a few windows, probably in cellar error, but I couldn't find any rough edges. It probably picked up some dirt. So this is what I tend to do with every card that I use. Um, anything that you're swiping in the seals is going to just get really dirty very quickly. So every time I make a swipe, like seriously, I'll try and point it out on this window, like every swipe I make inside of a seal, I pretty much then grab it and then I do this and just try and, and quickly clean off the edges. I do that for my squeegees, I do that for everything. Because I'm always like paranoid of picking up a little bit of dirt. So we'll count. I, I don't think I've ever really paid attention to how much I do it, but we'll see. It'll either be an absurd number or I'll, I'm exaggerating right now. Let's go on Shark Tank and bevel the edge. <laughs> Except like there's a patent on it. I'll, you know, I'll bring it up to him. And I, I mentioned it one time because it, like it was in, just in a casual conversation. I was like, yeah, and somebody picked it up and ended up using that one. He's like, oh, really? That's weird. And then I, he has no idea. Because he's a um, he's an inventor slash he's a tinter first. No, that's not right. He's more of an inventor than a tinter, but he's he has he installs like they do a lot of tint work, so he's become more of like an industry tool inventor. Um, and but there's there's very like. And when you talk to him, there's very engineering reasons why he does absolutely everything from the texture uh, to, like, the shape, the size. Like, there's so many decisions on every little bit of it. And I can definitely tell you the, that straight edge helps give it a little bit more rigidity. And he just wouldn't have thought that somebody would pick it up on that edge and use it. But then you got to take a look at how people actually use the tool. Molds are expensive, though. Even for cheap tools, doesn't matter. Molds can be, what, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, $40,000, depending on the size of the mold that you're getting. And so you got to sell a lot of tools to make up for that one mold change. Unless they can take, oh no, because the material's gone. I was going to say, unless they can take that one mold and mill it a little bit more. But nope. Nope, not this one because it's gone. They can remove material, but they can't add it back. Okay, so we're going to count during the install. So let's pull this down. Let's spray this off. Put this up. Big side in first. Here, I'm gonna zoom back a little bit so you guys can see. See this hanging off the side? 
I'm just worried about this right up here. We'll, we'll fold there, tuck that guy in. And we're gonna put this up on the glass. Pull it from right about there. Scooch. Oh, come on, scooch. There we go. Put that film up. Move it back over, get as close as we can to that edge because that's what makes it look really good. Night and day difference between Geo and Lexan. That's cool. I've tried to say this in, in my videos, I think. When, oh God, I'm, okay, I'm already doing it. Okay, let's start over. Squeegeeing off, get here, then I do this. Squeegee over the other way, do that. First swipe, swipe this off. Go to the other way, do that, swipe it off. Anytime that I am putting this inside the seals, I'm gonna swipe this card back off because it can just pick up dirt. And whenever you have dirt sitting along this edge, you risk scraping that against the film and putting lots of little micro scratches in it or really horrific gouges. So we got that all tacked up. So you're gonna see it a lot more really on the bottom because we only needed it for the swipes on the sides. But I do this with all my tools, squeegees, cards, doesn't matter. Flush that out. Maybe not the shank. I don't really have to swipe off the shank, but I'm not squeegeeing with it. Tuck that in. Spray. Oh yeah, and I do that too. <laughs> I picked up my squeegee, wipe it off. Do that, press it up to the edges. Get there, go over to the other side, swipe that off. Go over to this side, because the sides is where all your dirt's gonna settle. So we've pushed everything over from one side to the other side. We basically have to go around. There we go. Every time we go in, see those quick little like, zoop, it looks like I'm grabbing it. I'm literally just, every time I'm, I'm gonna slide it against the film, just run it against your hand super quick and you're just gonna basically grab that dirt off of the edge, whatever would cause problem. You can use a towel. Uh, there is a, an actual tri-edge tool that they also recommend and made for scratching windows. They call it Dismooth It. There's two versions. I don't, I don't give these enough of a chance really, but they do exist. So you take this, spray it a little bit. There's a fabric here. You're supposed to take this, and you can do this. You can, and this will keep the edge of that tri-edge going for longer. I, I typically just keep doing this, and then eventually you rough up the tri-edge, and then I just buy another one. But this is kind of... You know, some people say they sand things. This is something the actual maker of the triage um, figured out. And so it, it roughs it up similar to sandpaper, but it's, he says it's the right material for making sure that edge lasts a lot longer. So I believe it. Is Max Pro better than Lexin? Yeah, I would I would give it to Max Pro on that one. Max Pro I think is similar to Scorpion in terms of tiers. That's the impressions I get on those. Scorpion I hear mixed things on. Max Pro I hear mixed things on. So I'm always leery about that stuff. I think they got a better name now than they used to though. Kind of like Kia. 
How much it's in a car like this? Um, good question. So this one, we're doing all the sides in the rear. We're doing carbon uh, with the strips. So this one's 400. Usually we don't do windshield strips. Um, I've actually done three of them in the past past couple days. Everybody's getting a strip now. Saturday I did one. Uh, this morning I did one. And on this one I'm doing one too. If I don't do it for a while, then all of a sudden it'll be every car in a row or within a week. Like the Explorers. Like I hardly ever got an Explorer. Then all of a sudden like I was getting Explorers like every week. How can I sh how can I sheep your tools to Lebanon? <laughs> Sorry, you said sheep. I will put it on a sheep, and hopefully he finds you. Uh, best I can tell you is go to go to a site like Sun Distributing. Sun Distributing. Um, they ship internationally. I gave up on shipping internationally. I'm sorry. There's too many people that drove me crazy. Like. Not and it's not necessarily their fault either, but it was it was it was both. Like shipping international for me, like I don't ship a ton of orders, so it still costs you know thirty, thirty to forty dollars to like ship an order internationally, which is honestly not bad. Uh, but when somebody sees like, oh, I can go on AliExpress and get something for free, like I'm not AliExpress. And then. Um, yeah, there, there were too many orders that got hung up in customs and I, pfft, customs is, is just no man's land. Sometimes they just hold packages for whatever reason and there's big slowdowns and then I was starting to get packages sent back because they weren't shipping, uh, during the pandemic, like they cut off all shipments. And then, so I'm like, well, uh, this sucks. And then some people, they, you know, when they get it, then they're upset that they have to pay a VAT charge on top of it. And I'm like, I don't know anything about that. So I just, it's not worth it. It's annoying. You can, Sun Distributing is better at being a tool company than I am. How did you start? Out of a house or out of a shop? So I learned how to tint from shops. Uh, my dad owns a auto accessories company. He's not a tinter, um, but he had his business partner's son basically train me in the beginning. I was doing other automotive stuff. Like I was going to school for aviation mechanics. I wasn't looking to be a tinter and then it, it was a good opportunity. So I figured I'd, I'd just do it while I'm going to aviation mechanics school and then continue with that. Um, but I actually continued tinting. Finished aviation mechanics school, got too nervous of the entire industry. And especially nowadays, I think for good reason. So didn't foresee that happening. But I talked to some people, people that have been working in the industry for like 30 plus years and, they, and you know, when a company doesn't want you anymore, then they buy, <laughs> like that sucks. <laughs> Did you tint planes? <laughs> no. Um, there's there's actually a lot uh, to tint a plane. One, it's not glass. It's uh, like a plexiglass. And two, everything that is done to an aircraft needs to be certified. So technically, I mean, you could just go tint somebody's plane, and then they might not say anything. But if something happens with that plane, then you are in, uh, like, federal... booty blast territory there like you are you're doomed what's kind of crazy is mechanics can actually go to prison over improper mechanical procedures that get signed off on or the inspectors can or everybody can I don't know it's scary territory so everything's supposed to be certified that goes on an aircraft But me in high school, I had a, uh, I had a rep for the school come by and he was like, aviation mechanics is very promising and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yes, 
Let's do it. Sounds fun. I get to go work on some airplanes. And then I realized how much paperwork it is. And yeah, this is not fun. So then, uh, yeah, just kept sinning. Uh, but I started at my, uh, my dad's company and then eventually signed on with a mobile company and made a lot more money doing that, which was cool. But the headache was trying to want to do YouTube videos again while doing that at the same time. And that's just, that, that was just not possible. We're talking about tinning in spaces that are probably, yeah, yeah, about as wide as this green line. And that green line would also basically come to here, if not a little slimmer, so you have the doors basically opened up into the walls. Really bad lighting. You can tin in a lot of spaces. I make good money in those spaces too, so I'm not like totally upset, mostly just at the winter time when the car didn't fit all the way in a garage. So you got like a F-150 bed sticking out the back. And it's winter. And you realize how much cold air can get into a garage that already doesn't warm up very quickly. I work for Raytheon Technologies. I agree, all the rules and certifications for aircraft are ridiculous. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> I mean, you can definitely see how beneficial it's been because there's so many planes every day and very, very few accidents. But when the accidents happen, they're typically really horrible. So... It was just really surprising as somebody was like, oh, I'm going to work on airplanes. And at the time, like, I worked at an auto accessories company, right? So, like, you know, occasionally we'd see, like, a limo come in. People are getting lights on their cars. LED lighting was becoming more of, more of a thing. Radios were still interesting um, because we had just gone through, like, the whole flip-out phase. And then you have doubled-in radios. Um, but they were getting, like, more and more integrated. And it was, it was pretty cool. And then all of a sudden, the automakers stepped up their job, or stepped up their stuff by a lot, and then <laughs> aftermarket just can't keep up. So that took a turn. Um, but I, I figured, like, oh, working on airplanes, maybe you get into something cool like that. I don't know. I liked electronics and stuff. I just didn't know where to go with it. Didn't quite think that I could combine techie stuff with, uh, with window tinting. How many boats and RVs have you tinted? I've tinted more RVs uh, than boats. I've only tinted maybe like one or two boats. Uh, boats suck. If it's not a, if you get like, I think it's a Malibu or a Yamaha, those ones, if they have the dotted edges, so like, like this quarter window, if you have dotted edges around your boat window, then they're amazing to tint. I'd tint those all day long. Problem is there's a lot of really curved gasket style ones. Um, I just had to turn away the last one I did. I gave it about a good half day to try and tint that thing. It looks similar to the other one that I did on stream, but it was not. So whenever, whenever I spend a lot of time on something and I like if to tint it and I don't feel like I've actually made any progress, I kind of just like happen to tint it with enough frustration and error, then I don't really see a good plan moving forward with it. So uh, I, I kind of wanted to go, I thought boats would be great because I'm not that far away from like St. Clair. Um, and Michigan, you know, it's, it's the Great Lakes State. We have a couple of boats here. And boats have money. So anybody that can haul their boat in here 
would have been a really good opportunity and especially to kind of differentiate a little bit more. Um, especially with like the channel stuff, to do stuff other than cars once in a while I thought would be really, really cool. But unless it's a Malibu or a Yamaha, I don't want to touch it. Right, it's a Yamaha, they make instruments. Have you ever been offered residential jobs? Yeah, I have people that call. I politely declined. <laughs> it just started, <laughs> just started hinting, do I have to pay taxes? I only accept cash. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> just tell customers, only cash. Okay. So here's the thing. Yes, at some point, you have to pay taxes. Any income, no matter how you collect it, doesn't matter if it's cash, doesn't matter if it's through PayPal, doesn't matter if YouTube sends you a check, it's all recorded in some way, shape, or form. Cash is just the easiest way To fudge your numbers, essentially, is what you're doing with that. No, I don't make any money. No, you do. If you live somewhere and you have things, you've paid money for those things. It's just, what level of alert do you put on yourself? Um, so, yeah, you have to pay taxes no matter what. Everything is taxable. Any income is taxable, period. So you can do it as a, as a small business or you can do it personally. The smarter way to do it is do it through your business and then you can spend in certain ways that help maximize your savings on your taxes so you don't have to spend, you don't have to pay a lot on your taxes at the end of the year. But yes, you do. It's just a matter of when they're going to find it. Cash isn't traceable. What are you talking about? Checks, cash, or PayPal, all of that, but no cash. Come on, bro. Well, okay, if you're only accepting cash at some point, if you ever get audited, they're going to look at your living situation and what you do, and they're gonna look into everything, and they're gonna know that you make cash. <laughs> you can't go, oh, I'm just not making any money. It doesn't work that way. Uh, unless your state doesn't have income tax, lucky bastards. <laughs> but you still got federal taxes, which are the worst part. State taxes depends on your state. And yeah, some of them are, are pretty easy going. You don't have to report cash, man. Who does that? I don't. <laughs> okay, so... If you have a, God, okay, I'm not, not a fin financial advisor here. But look, if you've got cash coming in and other incomes coming in, so some people pay you with a card, some people pay you with the cash, it's still a way to post income without reporting all of it. That's why I said it's fudgeable on some level. But... If you don't report anything, that's when you get booty blasted by the IRS eventually. Good luck getting a mortgage with no income declared. That stuff too, right? Like, everything. So if that's why, like, some people are saying they only accept cash. If you only accept cash and you never report anything, then you're always trying to fly under the radar. And I don't know how long you can do that for. Like, everybody's a different case. But eventually, something not fun might happen. 
But if you're declaring something, then you're paying taxes on that something. And then you're more likely to be OK. Because like, oh, hey, you're another tax paying person. <sighs> oh, yeah, there it is. Cat, straight to your pocket, checks and all that, of course, bro, all the transactions, CC or debit, yes, but no cash. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, that's the difference there. We got people saying that they literally only accept cash, do they have to pay taxes? That's the difference. So, just a blanket statement like, <laughs> just a blanket statement like no you don't it's not traceable blah 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 well it's look it can you can still get into trouble if that's all you're doing not everybody runs the same business you do uh let's see what was that my dad didn't pay his taxes for decades but had to do something when he got old yikes I think now they're really having problems though um, because of the fun times that we're running into right now. So it's a numbers game. If you make like 1500 a month straight cash and you don't deposit in a bank, you're good. But more than that, you're screwed. Yeah, on some level. <laughs> it's an interesting conversation. That's for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of mystery. There's a lot of mystery about it when I first started. Like, I didn't understand it. It's because I used to think that, hey, maybe, you know, if you get paid through the Internet, it's different. But no, it's, it's not. It's all income which was really funny in the group when there was an article that came out about Cash App having to report above 600. If you get a check from anybody for over $600, or at least in Michigan, I think it's federal. Um, if you get a check for over $600, then they have to report it. So that's how some of these things get tracked too. So when you, when you go do a commercial job for somebody and you get paid $1,000 to do it. They have to then 1099 the business. Ugh. Or like if you're working for somebody, you do work for another company. They have to 1099 you for, for that amount. So it gets reported. If you don't report it, they're reporting it. They make as many ways possible for everything to get reported in some way, shape, or form. They just, they just want to get their piece. They're a business too. They got to make their, they got to make their piece. Yep. That was actually a really annoying thing. So any of you guys, if you tint exclusively for a shop and that's all the money that you make and they're 1099ing you, um, they're, they're doing a not so great thing to you. That happened to me actually for a long time. Whenever you're considered an employee of a company, um, the company is responsible for part of your taxes and they're also responsible for taking those taxes out of your check before they pay you. Um, that's so the government gets theirs and then they give you this fun rebate as an incentive to then file your taxes. But when you get paid a 1099 up front, you're all excited because like, yay, I got a big check. But then you're responsible for paying taxes at the end of the year, um, actually during the year, and you actually have to pay more of it that way. 
Which that sucks. You're considered a contractor. I get paid by cash in my shop. Yeah, cash under the table. That's uh, That helps them out just as much as it... Well, cash under the table, they, they take responsibilities for some of that income. But they're also, like, it's not a good way to go about it. Again, you can try and fudge your numbers. I have a regular job on the books, 10 on the side only for cash, no red flags. See, there you go. That's a little better. You just, you just got to have a couple of different ways that you're making money. And then report one. This is, again, this is, this is not financial advice. Cash is cash, you don't have to report it no matter what. Ay, ay, ay. That's what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, ay, ay, ay. that was a way to stay 100% tax free, I know every tin shop would only ever accept cash, always. Because why would you do, why would you do it any other way? Alright, can we talk about tint now? Happy fourth. <laughs> uh, I got a little finger here I got to press out, a couple little air pockets. Um, I don't know, I just started on this uh, quarter window here. So let's get that rolling. Oh yeah, I walked over there, I need my light too. I have so much fireworks ready for tonight. <laughs> we actually went out and we saw some yesterday. We bought some last year. This year we haven't bought any. I don't know. We're we're moving into a house though, so like we're sounds fun. Always sounds fun to blow up some money. But we ended up uh, we ended up buying stuff for and we did our own little Korean barbecue thing yesterday. That was really good. No plotter today, I guess not at this point. When I've got a car that's pretty straightforward like this one without a windshield, um, sometimes it's it's a little like pick and choose. I don't have a good reason for it. I just do it. This is how I do most cars. Look at that. Michigan assembled. Oh, we're gonna save that. I don't know if he cares. Is a glass aid clay bar safe on other surfaces? Yeah, it should be. Um, I don't test it on other surfaces though. But yeah, it's a synthetic clay bar that should be fine on, on paint and everything. But I just know I just use it for for tint. How do you like the flooring? Uh flooring's been good. If if you're kinda like me, okay, so so where it's really made for is to decorate a floor and forget about the underside of it for a good long time. So I don't have floor drains. All the dirt and crap falls through, goes to the bottom. The, the tiles still get a little dirty, but like, you know, the majority of the dirt falls through to the bottom and then it just kind of builds up over time. So if that annoys you, 
this flooring might not, might not be for you. But every once in a while, um, you should remove it and then clean underneath it. It's probably that time. I think we did it last year. Around summertime. My biggest fear, leaving a box blade in a car. Yep, especially near like a baby seat or something. I'd leave them in my pockets a lot. It's a habit that I try not to have anymore. Have you noticed mold? No, but it looks pretty dirty under there. Everything dries out relatively quickly here. So in the wintertime, it stays cold, but it still dries out. And in the summertime, it dries faster, but I'm not, I don't have like a ton of water. So I'm not washing cars. It's not constantly staying soaked. It's just, there's baby shampoo uh, and there's just soapy water and some dirt that goes down and settles. So it just kind of looks gummy and gross, but you can't see it until I like lift everything up. There's a live stream that I did where I did all that. I like the tiles. Thank you. I do too. Ugh. What are some cars to look out for? Be careful when you're tinting. Um, the only ones that really come to mind right now are like Chrysler windshields. So that's like the Ram. That's the 300. Um, to just anything Chrysler, just make sure it's covered up. And also join the Facebook groups because that's where you really find stuff like that. Because there'll be like a new car that come out or a big issue and all of a sudden like a lot of tenors will have to deal with it because they didn't know like, oh, hey, this new vehicle has this problem. Um, I think the latest one that I saw was the Mercedes C-Class. They call it the SAM module in the trunk when that gets wet. Like Mercedes actually put out a PSA to window tinters or to customers, or no, sorry, not to customers, to uh, their, their mechanics, saying that, like, hey, if one comes in, it's probably because a tinner fucked it up. But yeah, the only headaches that I've really come across are like Chrysler's. Everything else is kind of like a one-off one -off situation. I think I want to grab this guy up here. Maybe this one too. This one. I honestly never use a bulldozer anymore. What? The reach? Are you high? What's good about the re- Oh, I don't- Can you make a video, please? Can somebody for the love- Can somebody please make a video of them using a reach, post it in the group, so I understand how to use that thing? Because I hate it. I love Tri-Edge, but I just don't get the reach. I've talked to them. I've tried it. It's kind of a love or hate type of thing, but I think everybody that hates it is probably using it wrong. And I started using an eight inch flat glass squeegee on the back windows and windshield. That sounds like, that, I think I'll appreciate that a lot. So I'm gonna get one of those. Yeah, the shortcut, this was, uh, this was such a promising looking tool. Um, he made it really for one purpose, but people try and use it for more. So on VW Jetta's um, slash Passat's, the lower corner areas, that's what he made the squeegee for. So 
I want to pick it up and it's like, oh, this is Triage's version of a side swipe. It, it, it doesn't work the same. It's just not as good for going along here, but for the really tight corners and stuff, it's pretty good for that. But the thing is, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for this thing instead, more often than not. So like, it's good to have this, um, but I, it's, you're not going to use it most of the time. How did that not, how did your squeegee not take the sticker off? Oh, it's a sticker. I don't know. I just, I don't try and, even though it's all cracked and stuff, I wouldn't remove it unless he wants me to. You can squeegee over stickers. It's weird that I used it for those cars exclusively, I have no idea if that was his purpose. I think that's also one of the problems too, is like when you're buying it in a store, it doesn't say that. But when you talk to him, he's like, yeah, that's why I made it. And you're like, oh. I didn't realize that. Oh, I took the, hang on. How do you like the orange side swipe versus the blue? They're both, I, some people Some people debate me on it. I think they're both the same. I can feel a difference when I, when I touch the squeegee, but in actual use, I can't tell a difference, man. So for me, it's like, hey, I get two sides of the same material. The material is just great. You can't, there's, I don't think there's a better squeegee material out there. So most people see the the green and the orange and their like marketing is is about the like two durometers on one squeezy blade but when you like when you're using it you're using it as a whole right so the blue and the orange is kind of like working together um, but there is like a little flex difference between the orange and the blue if you put a blindfold on me and you go, which side is which, I would say I can't tell a difference. But some people say that they can feel a difference, so. It's just the material is completely different from an actual orange crush, it's better. It's the best material that they've got. Happy 4th of July, boys. <laughs> I use my reach way more than the tail fin. Yeah, you're going to have to show me that one. I got to see it. You sound crazy, but I appreciate that too. It's I always enjoy when somebody like I have a strong opinion about somebody or something. And then somebody just comes in and, no, use it this way. And then, like, that's how it was with the shank. I was like, that thing's so stupid. And he's like, no, you have to give it a try. And then I used it. And then I'm like, okay, this is amazing. <laughs> but if I'm having that problem, literally hundreds of other tinters are having that same problem. And that's what I've heard. Like, you either love or hate that tool. Oh, you can prop up a phone in the back window and talk about it. Just ordered that knife aid tape. I'm excited. Cool, I appreciate it. <laughs> I love it. Straight up grow. Hey, I'm starting my own window tint shop. What do you recommend to get started in terms of film and acquiring customers? Do you have, like, are, have you tinted before? Where are you at? Because that that is scary. 
that's a that's a like hey I'm starting it and I don't know anything about it I gotta learn <laughs> it's a, I wanted to do it with a with a pretty decent plan and it's always good to learn as you go but I need to know where you're coming from I have not tinted before. I have not tinted before. I'm a pro commercial installer. So you're a professional, like, flat glass installer? Have you tinted your own car? Are you starting a flat glass business? Professional commercial rap graphics specialist in Los Angeles, California. Why are you opening a tint business? This is interesting. I need to, I need to understand a little bit more before I just start. Bleh. Oh come on, Cannon. <laughs> oh no, we might go to Hollyland. Why does it say no video? My battery did not die. It just lost the connection. So hang on a second. Oh, and it's back. We're going to the Holy Land. I thought it was too soon for a dead battery. It just lost connection. Straight up grow. Okay, so professional commercial rap graphics specialist in LA. Customers ask me for tint and PPF. I'm striving to be a master installer tint rap PPF. So like, okay, you right now you do vinyl, like that's your main thing. Um, and so I'm assuming you worked for somewhere and now you're opening your own place, starting with vinyl work and looking to get into tint. Is that what's going on? It always happens when it's inconvenient. <laughs> it's always when we're tinning a car. I don't know what it is. <laughs> what type of film should be used for window tints as a beginner? Uh, you can use a relatively inexpensive film. Just look for like a one and a half mil film. So at this point, I, 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 lately I've just been recommending Tint Depot, Sun Distributing both those places to get some film. They seem to be your best bang for the buck. I had never tinted before, but when I started, I went all in, bought a graph tech, bought Lumar, was a blessing and a curse because I wanted to give up, but couldn't because of the money I was deep in. Yeah, it's setting yourself up for a headache. I've been installing for myself for years. Oh, okay. I can't, so I, I don't understand your full story, um, but I'm getting little pieces here and there. So you, you have a skill and you're looking to start a tent shop, but you've been installing for yourself for years. Um, well, I would really leverage going after that skill first because like, I mean, that's what you do. So have a shop that just accommodates more of what you do and then focus on adding tint on the side. Start with some easy stuff, like start doing doors. Anybody that comes in for a wrap job that also wants their front doors tinted, start doing that. Um, look around for other shops and tinters, maybe somebody that can come in and then they can tint while you're doing wrap. I, I don't know, man, like, I think it's worth learning like 80 to 90% of a skill so you always can have yourself as backup, but when you have a real specialty skill, 
I'm only making three to four K a day as a commercial installer. Wanna bump it up more? <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I'm only making three to four grand a day. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it sounds like you're doing great. Okay, you need a team, man. You need to start hiring. You don't need to learn another skill. You need to start hiring. I hope you have people that help. Because when you're making three to four K a day, there's room to hire people. You need to find all the things that waste your time and keep you away from focusing. <sighs> you basically need to, everything that you're doing, you need to make like other people do that. I have two employees, good, okay. That's good. See, this is why I ask a bunch of questions, because this took a completely different turn. First, you sounded like a guy that like had never, I've never tinted before, and therefore I have no skills. I want to open up a shop. Walk me through what I need to do. And that's setting yourself up for a scary failure. But you're, you're doing three to four K a day doing wrapping, and you have a couple of employees, and you want to bring it up from there. Um, well. If you're maxed out on like, can you take in more commercial work and just start training more commercial and just keep moving in that area? Like, are you completely scaled out? Because that is, that would be my first thing is like, okay, I need a space so I can accommodate more work. I'm gonna bring in more installers so this work goes faster. I'm gonna teach them what I know and then I'm gonna oversee what they do and then I'm just gonna grow a gigantic wrap business and then worry about window tinting after that. Because adding, adding tint onto that, I hate to say that it's not gonna be worth your time, but for a little while, it's not gonna be worth your time at that. You're making great money doing what you're doing and if the more you can scale that, because you clearly have a system down, the better you can get into that. Um, but I can see adding window tinting on to the cars that you're doing um, is always helpful, but reach out to other shops that might do mobile, and then maybe you can at least get started that way so they can come in, they can do the window tint, you pay them uh, for their services. Obviously, you get a good cut. You get a cut of that too, so you're still making money on that tint work, but there also might be opportunity to learn that way. As an installer enthusiast, I like to learn new My things, and mostly do like to be work done right. To 4K a day. Ha ha ha! Just scraping by. Awesome. <laughs> Mike, exactly right. Mike with a five. Thank you. Three to four K a day. Ha <laughs> ha! Just scraping by. <laughs> I know it like took such a turn. Uh, I mainly specialize in big commercial wraps. 52 foot semis, 30 foot box trucks. Nice, that sounds like work that can easily be handed off to somebody else. Okay, so like I then, like I, I totally get wanting to learn, learn another skill and, and go down that path. So that's as simple as just putting in the time to do it. So teach people how to take your job so then you can focus on learning how to tint and then watch videos, take a class, start moving in that direction, so then you know how to do a good amount of it, but you always have somebody to take care of the work that's being done. But as far as like the marketing and stuff goes, man, I would just like, oh, I was gonna say you can leverage the, the current business that's coming in to break into window tinting, whatever, whatever jobs you have coming in um, for commercial wrapping, like you could potentially have customers there for window tinting as well and get started on doing their cars, but you gotta free up your own time first.
I don't know. I have I have a mixed opinion on it because there's I understand wanting to learn multiple skills so you can take on multiple services and stuff. Dude, you window tinning is a full-time service and anything beyond window tinning is like an extra service that I have to grow. And what I've noticed was like when I was doing paint protection film, I basically made a similar amount doing paint protection film as doing window tinning. Or if I made more in paint protection film, then why wouldn't I just keep doing paint protection film? But when you're doing one thing and then bouncing around to the next thing, that's where like your focus starts getting split and like the money doesn't make as much sense. But if you just like to do it, that's a whole different thing. You need to find people that'll that'll take your that'll take your job essentially. Um, but for getting clients and stuff, um, literally just having a shop, staying listed, um, having a website that shows the different services that you do and being a resource for why somebody would want the different types of films. You know, if somebody's looking into ceramic and they want to learn about ceramic film, they should learn about it off your, your own business website. Because then when they learn about it and they're like, oh, okay, that's cool, this shop seems cool, then they're going to come to you. Um, a lot of health, like a, another really strong way that I was talking about before, but I don't know if this, like, when you're doing commercial work for big trucks and stuff, like, I, I can see how that doesn't give you a lot of automotive tint customers because they're a little bit different. You're doing fleet work. But maybe the people that are giving you the jobs can give you a start. Tint whiz, is that a good way to get out there? No, tint, like tint whiz is a good way to send proposals and stuff. So that helps. Um, but it, it's not like a lead generator. I also do everything, tire dealer, vinyl, and tint dealer, supply shop. Of course, I'm going to delegate everything since I can't do it all myself. Well, it's good. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I'm a little stuck because I don't even know if there's anything that I can really tell you that you haven't thought about already. Because you're already in multiple businesses. You obviously understand how business works. There's a lot of people that ask on this channel that, that maybe want to start a shop or something, but they have, they have nothing yet. So window tinting, growing that base isn't a lot different from growing any other type of business. There's general interest. There's, there's general business inquiries just from existing, and then the better that you can do to expand on that with uh, being like an educational resource, putting more ads out um, in, you know, Google, Facebook, other social platforms and whatnot. Tick, <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what was funny? So... I I was kind of I actually I still am. I looked at the views. So I po I posted on TikTok um that I had a video that did like 13 million views on TikTok. Posted the same video on YouTube. It's so far done like 50,000 views. Um which is still good, but it's like Come on, why would it do 13 million on this one platform and only 50,000 on this other one? This client came off of that, that uh, YouTube short. He saw that, got introduced to the channel, saw that I was in the area, and then he brought in this car. Like, how cool is that? I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to invest more on YouTube shorts. <laughs> Do you get a lot of customers from YouTube, TikTok, and Google? So obviously the most of my clients from anywhere, they're going to come from YouTube. Um, I, I just dominate a lot of the search. So whenever somebody is searching anything about window tinting, they're generally going to find one of my videos. That's really strong. 
Now, what, the part that always bummed me out was it was never a service that I could send across the country. They have to bring their cars here. So I only hit you know, a circle from here and a handful will come out from, from here. But the fact that a lot of people, when they're looking for window tinting, see this channel is super, super cool. Um, but yeah, not everybody comes from the YouTube channel. But I do get a fair amount of clients um, that have seen the channel and then want to bring their car in. And it's really cool because then they already kind of get what is going on here. They, they've seen the process. They've heard me talk. It's not really, like, even if they haven't had tint before, it's not necessarily completely new. It's just like, whoa, I get to see the space in person. And he seems like he does good work, so I'm going to go there. I think that's super helpful for, like, any type of business. You should do, oh, the tint shade comparison? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually should do a lot more, um, a lot more videos like that. That's super cool. My buddy is an Expel dealer in Riverside. He says he's booked a month or two in advance, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, you can get crazy booked out. Um, I think we're seeing, like, okay. It's obviously been a thing for a while, but since, like, the big shutdowns and stuff, like, so when everybody came back to work, dude, there was just piles of work for everybody. So when you were brand new into it and starting then even, it just, you had more opportunities. I think it's definitely slowed down some, but there's still, compared to like what there was, but there's still plenty of work out there. It's cool. But... You can open up a tent shop tomorrow and you still got to grind it out. Like when, that's the thing, when people don't recognize your business and know who you are, like that, that's just something that takes time and you can try and fast track it with putting videos out there, having a good website together. Um, and when you are the first person that they come across that they like, then you're most likely to get that business and all the referrals that come off of that business. So the longer that you just exist, the more business that you're naturally gonna get. But figuring out what ways to stick in people's minds or be found when they're looking, that's, uh, that's always an interesting game. So for me, obviously I, I put a lot of effort into YouTube I have my Facebook group too. That doesn't really help with, uh, with personal jobs though. Not a lot. Some people have gotten leads off of it. Looks good, make sure this is lined up. <laughs> this is tall. This is a tall windshield. It's very sloped, so like when you have it this far down, it actually like a good amount of this windshield comes up high. So this is 5%, good size windshield. So we're putting a big old strip on it. Ching. 
I don't know what it is about a windshield strip. I always, like, it's funny to me just doing them. Like, because when I'm done all the sides in the rear, if I'm not doing a full windshield, then I'm like, okay, car's done. And then it's like, oh, but they're getting a strip too. And I'm like, oh, damn it. <laughs> it's not something that takes a long time to do. It's just like an extra thing. Maybe it's just having to line it up back and forth. It gets a little tedious or whatnot, but... Yeah, I don't I don't think they look bad. They're they're really practical, especially when they're when they're decent size. That if you're commuting a lot and you're driving like late afternoon, early morning, that sun gets in a really annoying spot. I measure it constantly. Um, he's waiting up front, so I ended up, I ended up doing this ahead of time, uh, lining it up on the, on the outside, and then, then he went back up, up front, and we're throwing it in. That way it would all kind of be ready to go when I got to this point. Sweet. Looks good. Uh, how many cars can one person tint in a day? So all the all the sides and rear is kind of to me a standard job, but I've had so many add windshields or full windshields that it, it just kind of depends. I plan for no longer I tell people to plan no longer than two hours for all the sides and the rear. Everything just went haywire. Hang on. Okay, it's back. I think, like, as a shop, two hours for all the sides and the rear at the most. Um, and then an extra half hour, 45 minutes for a windshield. And then, then break that down to hours in a day. So, realistically, like, it's a, like, I'd say that's a nice, comfortable s speed for one person to handle. Um, but when you get a small crew together, you have somebody on the doors, somebody on the back window, um, and you can get all that done inside half hour, 45 minutes. It's just when you have one person in charge of doing everything. So you can, you can, you can definitely scale window tinning. Um, but it's going to rely on either a very skilled person at hand cutting or somebody also running a plotter alongside of the installers. Do you have any banners or flags outside for the films you use? Like outside, outside? N like outside the doors? No, I only have like a little a little door sign too. I gotta make this place a little easier to find for the people that actually have appointments. <laughs> but I kind of, I kind of like it. Cause I just cater to appointments only. I like to get one or two skilled guys. Problem is everybody is so unreliable nowadays. Yep. Yep. You're going to have a fun time trying to grow a tent business in the same way that you've grown. So with, with vinyl, I, I'd say, okay, with vinyl and flat glass, it's still not simple to scale that business, but it's easier than it is, I think, with window tinting and paint protection film. Cars are so tedious to do, and there's a lot of competition. With flat glass, 
Um, there's still competition, but it's, it's easier to teach somebody how to do flat glass. And there's more that you can make per square foot than there is for automotive. Automotive, you have to learn a lot of ins and outs of tinting and shrinking and, oh, this guy's got a problem with this one car, so then he ties up half your day, trying to, you're trying to fix it for him. Where architectural is like, you know, when you're doing, let's say like a, a skyscraper or something, there's a lot more glass there, a lot bigger money paying for that, a lot more work to do, but are they gonna nitpick every single window? Probably not. You're going to pay a contract company to come in, and then they'll move on to the, the millions of other things that they have to take care of. Just like you're doing lots of fleet work, similar for architectural, harder for automotive. So basically, I, do, I don't do color change wraps. I mainly focus on commercial. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was getting the vibe of. It's smart. There's more money there. It's just, you know, like anything, it can get boring, I'm sure. But it's good money. It's nice because you just have to convince one person in charge of a business to, like, give you all the commercial wrapping works. And then all of a sudden you have, like you know, all the Amazon trucks to do. And they're just like, you know, is, the, is Amazon gonna nitpick the quality of it too? <laughs> Not necessarily. Not the same level of somebody nitpicking a color change wrap on a residential car. So, uh, da -da. See, exactly, you know, you get what I'm saying in the concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I don't think you can do the same thing for cars that you can do with, uh, for window tint that you can do with wrapping. I mean, on the fleet side of things, front windows on certain vehicles, but again, like semi-trucks, they have state laws and it's probably not something that they're gonna buy for the drivers. Makes sense that they're gonna wrap them because it's literally business advertising. But it's totally different, it's a, it's a B2B business. It's totally different from, from going in and doing cars um, for people. Nobody cares about Amazon, Walmart, and distribution vehicles, but somebody will give you a hard time about color change wrap for a fraction of the price. So, yeah, and you can imagine um, why I'm wondering why you're getting into the tinting space. <laughs> from, from, money, from a money sense, it doesn't make sense for you. Not really. It makes sense to go after more commercial business and, and scale into that. But for sheer fun... Um, yeah, you could get into the automotive world, but as a, as for tinting, it makes more sense to get into the architectural side of it. Build up flat glass. There's a lot more opportunity there. Everybody here getting into auto is like, what the hell, man? Why are you teaching me how to do cars? You should be doing buildings. I, I do cars. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's where I started. I like being in my, my little garage here. How long have you been window tinting? Uh, 15 years. Mary 4th, thank you. Mary 4th. Yeah, there's big business. Yeah, flat glass is definitely more scalable. So the, uh, the 
creator of Tint Wiz, that came from a flat glass company. Like, so he didn't know, he's got a really interesting story. So he didn't know anything about architectural film and they didn't even have like a office. So he literally like started a commercial tinting company basically off of Craigslist. So he found a flat glass tinter, started booking jobs, gave it over to the flat glass tinter to do, and then just scaled that, right? All you need to do is exist online. Somebody calls you, you show up at their place. They're not showing up at your tint shop for commercial work, not necessarily. But you know, you got somebody in an office who's like, hey, we wanna get these windows tinted. Okay, let me look around, let me call some places. Oh yeah, we'll come out, we'll bid the job. Okay, cool, thank you. Right, like when you call a window company for your house, are you going to the window company or you're calling specialists to come out and evaluate your house? So, um, it's the work, like it's easier as a whole too because like flat windows are easier to learn how to tint than curved windows are. I gotta learn seal types and I gotta learn, um, like it's so individualized. I'm sure a lot of you guys understand that part, but I'm, as this job right here, I am trying to find one customer at a time and I have a max amount that I can get per customer and I gotta make sure that customer is happy with that one job that I'm doing. When you have commercial work, you're trying to attract a business and they have a fleet or a skyscraper or a hotel or this or that that'll make you far more money getting that one thing and you just have to impress one person versus what you're gonna get off of the car. The real nice thing about auto though is that the cars come to you so you can, you can sit here, it's less running around. <laughs> so I, I was just really impressed at, like especially talking to, to people um, like I remember uh, like Patrick telling me the flat glass company he was working for they did over two million dollars in flat glass a year auto was like 180,000 of that like they don't care about auto at all it's pennies compared to what they're making and then they're still paying two tenors to get all that work done, right? Like, they're hardly making shit off of auto. Where flat glass, there's millions there, so there's a lot more money, and you can hire a crew of people and pay them differently because it's easier to teach the skill. So if y'all want flat glass, I mean, it's out there. It's just a matter of trying to get it. I always wondered how to start. And then somebody told me one day, they're like, well, I just started with my own auto clients. Chances are, they literally said this, like chances are that person has a place that they live and maybe they're gonna want those windows tinted after you tint their car windows. So just let all your auto customers know that you also do commercial work. Eventually somebody's gonna get it. And then next thing you know, that neighbor is telling their next door neighbor because they, you're out there tinting their house windows. And then all of a sudden the whole neighborhood starts to get it, right? And then it kind of just, exp it, it blows up from there. But I like, whenever somebody calls me about flat glass work, dude, I, I like doing what I do. I know how to do cars. I like not traveling around. Um, but I also have my channel, which is like a way different focus from a lot of other tent companies. So I'm not looking to break into that, but it's a hell of an opportunity for anybody that wants to take it. What film do they usually use? Um, there's a lot of staple companies. So like Lumar, uh, Axbell just partnered with like Veloce. Uh, Avery Dennison is a big flat glass film um, 
3M has big commercial lines. Like, honestly, <laughs> I think a lot of these, these companies maybe just piddle around with automotive cannon. <laughs> I think it's the same thing for, uh, for window tint companies, uh, window film manufacturers as it is for, uh, um, for, for us people. Like, we're a bunch of whiny prima donnas that do cars. But the real money, I think, is for a lot of these architectural films when they get, you know, selling like tons of rolls for, to get a skyscraper tinted, right? So you can just, there's a lot of opportunity for them too, the more people that get into architectural. So a lot of the staple companies though, like Avery Dennison, 3M, basically like every major film company also has an architectural line of film. It's super cool talking directly to uh, directly installer to installer. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, all the fun and crappy behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, you have a super sweet setup. I would do the same. Yeah, it's fun. But again, like having a setup like this and spending three, four hours on a car, like. It's not the like it doesn't make a ton of money just doing that. Like it only makes sense if you're moving a lot of cars or you charge a lot more per car or you have something that kind of carries it alongside. But you can still like as an individual at your home and stuff, you can still make good money tinting cars, don't get me wrong, but that's where like if I'm tinting for a shop or if I'm not doing the YouTube channel, I'm pulling in three, four cars a day. Like my goal is at least a thousand, a thousand a day in window tinting. That's not three to four K in vinyl wrapping. That's also why I'm kind of laughing about it, but I've got some extra stuff to help out. So that's not what I'm looking to do. I spent $200 on material and still suck. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's no fun. Yeah, tinning, tinning cars is hard, man. Mm, can you tell me GeoShield easiest or hardest to shrink? So, okay, any, like, any film that I go to shrink, I can make it look easy. Like, learning shrinking is still, is still a thing, even with an easy film. Always keep that in mind. Um, GeoShield is just a very easy automotive film to shrink compared to a lot of other automotive films. But that being said, a lot of them have gotten more user friendly. I would just trust it long term too. That's a big thing. I'm aware of the price difference. It's okay, I don't mind. It's stable and constant as, as fleets do have brakes. Yeah, well, that's good. No, it sounds like you gotta, sounds like you know what you're doing. That's why I was like really surprised. Like I'm opening up, a, I wanna open up a tint business soon. Can you tell me how to market and stuff? And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you, you have like a fleet commercial company, which is like, that's super cool. A lot of people would wonder how you even got into that. That's super interesting. Some of the best work that I did was, uh, so I had 40 DNR trucks to do. Um, we charged, what, 100 something bucks for per set of doors and got them all done within like, I got them all done within two days. Um, like 20 one day, 20 the next or whatever, just had somebody literally pulling them in back to back, just two doors, two doors, two doors, two doors, two doors. And they don't quality check anything. They don't care. They're going to get brand new trucks the next year anyways, as long as you get it on the windows and it doesn't look terrible, I guess. I don't know. There isn't a lot of quality control on it, but it doesn't matter. Very easy windows to do. But that kind of work is awesome. It gets boring, but you make a lot of money doing it. I noticed it's a pain to get quality film. You either have to be a dealer or get it somewhere else. That's one reason I like Geo. Um, so you don't have to order large quantities or anything like that. Um, so it gives a lot more people opportunities. Because you're right, if you're looking at the staple brands like uh, Lumar, 3M, um, 
God, Lumar 3M, Expel, like a lot of these companies, they're going to want you to order maybe like a minimum minimum per month. They're going to already want to see that you're kind of established, like, and a minimum like buy-in. Um, but there's still, like, there's a lot of really good companies that are using, I swear, the exact same, they're getting the exact same films. Not, ex so there's some that you just can't, like, l nobody is getting Lumar, right? But there are manufacturers where big companies are ordering from that are, they're just getting their skew of it. Um, and those, those, I think, are the special companies that you can, you can get you know, a good in on starting a, a hell of a film business and you can grow up with them and you never have to change because there's no reason to. But if you ever wanted to, you also have opportunities with bigger companies, but then they just charge you more for film. And if they even provide you the real value at that point, it's, it's, it's tough to say. Some people utilize it, some people don't. Helios is available if some distributing. Easy to get Max Pro. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of films that are easy to get. It's just figuring out which ones are worth your time and which ones aren't. Isn't it only like three companies that make film? Eastman, Global, Quarry. There's a couple more. Um, there's definitely some films that come out of like South Korea. Um, they probably don't have as big of a brand, but those are like the main three ones that people talk about. Uh, actually, Global is Guari, so that would be two. Um, but yeah, there's other companies that make film too. Um, so Avery Dennison is a good example. They're actually like, Avery Dennison is their own manufacturer out of Haneda, Israel. I see you using GeoShield, so I'm easily influenced because of watching you install different types. Yeah, because I got asked for years. <laughs> Like, I was installing Lumar, and I was installing Avery, and, like, any time I install anything, everybody asks. I can take any of these films and make them look relatively easy to work with just because I've used so many. But there are, like, this is legitimately one that I like to put on my customer cars, one that I would trust long term. Um, but there's definitely other companies out there that I would feel just as comfortable with. But then you run into all those little things, too, right? Like, how much of a business does the company expect you to have before you approach them getting their film? Like even Lumar, it's not terrible, like 800 bucks a month in minimum film cost is what I've heard. That's not bad, that's really not bad at all. Um, but it shows that you actually, like for some people it's like, oh shit. For an established business that's like, okay. <laughs> I buy a couple rolls of ceramic and it's $800, so what do I give a shit? How to tell dyed film from carbon slash ceramic. How to tell dyed film from carbon slash ceramic to avoid getting ripped off. Uh, the easiest way is just gonna be sitting in your car, roll your, like, turn on the air conditioning, face it in the sun, and then roll up the window. If you feel a lot of heat on your skin, then it's not gonna be carbon or ceramic. I mean, it could still be carbon, but you're gonna feel a big difference between the two. Um, the only way to really definitively test it is actually buying a meter or going to a shop that has one. Other than just like that superficial, like this doesn't feel like it's doing what it should. All right, I gotta shout out some super chats. Have you done a 96 Civic hatchback? Yeah, and it sucks. We always got weird cars. Like this was really, I, I, this was so bizarre. Whenever we would hire in a new person, this weird, annoying car. Like one time we had, the first car that they had to do was like an, a 90 CRV. There was another time that it was literally that Civic hatch. You gotta take some hardware off to do it. It's annoying, it's really curved. It's not a super fun window to do. Whenever you're getting back into like pre-2000s, you're running into more and more things that just give you a hard time. Go like 2010 and up. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna shout out some supers. Big thanks to Mike. 
Mike, Daniel, Bell. Oh, wait, that was last one. So Mike Hobbs, Mike Hobbs, and Daniel Reyna, thank you guys so much for the supers today. I appreciate you. Do you make good side money streaming and other sources? I know you offer classes, which is cool. Yeah, it's actually a big part of my business. Um, so like actually streaming, mm, eh, not really. Like it's OK. Um, like there's super chats. That always helps. But the videos themselves only get typically like a couple thousand views. Um, the, what really helped out was uh, stuff like the, the store that I have. So like Glass Aid, the rolls, the clay bars, the little things that I have um, that are kind of like, you know, particular to the store. So like the Detroit Tint Studio Strides and stuff like that. That makes a big difference. But those are like, I use those with every car that I tint because that's how I tint cars. So finding little ways that I can continue to do something that I like, um, that's, that's been really, really cool. Are you going to restock squeegee handles soon? <laughs> Working on it. Um, I would get the Fusion one, though. Sun Distributing, that Fusion one. Uh, Fusion Shorty handle. That one is a great squeegee handle. Tint Depot or Sun Distributing. This is... Wow, no kidding. Wow, okay, hang on. Yeah, I'm seeing the critical error thing on Sun Distributing's website too. That's no good. Especially on a holiday when people are looking to buy tools and stuff. Five inch shorty handle is 30 friggin' dollars now? What the fuck? Ah, oh, it's the best though. Sorry, I just, like, last time I looked, it was, like, $25. Inflation's kind of insane. This is an amazing handle. It will last you for years. Discounts? No. I don't, they don't give me any discounts to give people. It's kind of sad. I've made my own tools before and thought of some. Then you should definitely, like, figure out a way to sell them. Installers find the best workarounds and new ways to do stuff. The hardest thing is just getting it out there. No, it's it, like I searched something on their site, clicked on a product, and the, it gave me a oops. That's no good. That's, uh, that's one of those freakish work timing things where, oh, holiday, we're going to be gone uh, and enjoy the weekend. And then all of a sudden... Actually, I do, I do, um, actually, I should check my, my site quick. So I don't do, you know, I do discounts slash not discounts. The way that I did discounts was like, okay, for some of these things, like, if you want to buy one off, then it costs X amount, but if you buy three or five, that's when you get a discount on something. And I think that's pretty fair. So like three bucks a shank if you buy five of them, if you buy them in a five pack, um, and there's a few things like that with like the felt cards, especially like the glass aid rolls and stuff like that. So you buy five rolls, then it's 6.50 per roll, you buy 10 rolls, then it's $6 per roll. So it was a way for me to like, for anybody that was asking for like some sort of a discount, it's like, if you buy a little bit more, then there's more money to work with to then give you a little discount on it. It just a blanket discount on one-off items. It usually means that the company is like losing money, <laughs> because a lot of tool companies they run on relatively slim margins. So there's just there wasn't a lot of money there. But when there's more money, like then you can do stuff like free shipping, multi, like bigger discounts on on overall orders, stuff like that. That's so cool. Get your own store and tools going. 
Yeah, and that was uh, that's been a real big. Uh, let me sh let me show you. Just stop. So I never really intended all these things to kind of pop up on here. Um, we started so this was with like the certified tinder thing with Patrick. Um, I got a hold of like a lot of inexpensive. Uh, tools that I could recommend for starting out with, but still save you some money. Um, and as you can see, a lot of them ended up selling out at this point. The um, where things started to change is like then I came up with Glass Aid, and that started to take off. Um, and then um, like the felt cards were doing well, um, and that's like a big staple. And then I decided to get Detroit Tin Studio on that, and then I found out I can get green edition shanks. And I was like, oh, that's super cool. And then Triage calls me one day. And, and then we worked on this collab. So like literally one of my favorite tools, we were able to make it green. So this is my color, Detroit Tint Studio Edition Triage. Like how cool is that? And then from there, I find little things that I feel like are holes in the industry. So clay bars I really like for cleaning back windows. And then I added my own to that. Detroit Tint Studio Squeegee, that was another one that I really like. Uh, that I was able to get Detroit Tin Studio on that too. So like, there's these little things. I always keep my eye out for these like little holes in the in the market. Um, there, like, this is essentially what I call my merch. Like, because I'm only I'm t-shirts don't really sell, but things that actually sell and are really cool is like to take this like something you're going to use on your own vehicles and stuff while while you're. Um, learning or installing full time, whatever the case, like it, it's really cool to have that crossover there. That that's kind of come about a lot in like the last year, year or two at this point. I bought over a hundred dollars for the stuff of your site. I would buy more if you carried them, but I'm sure it's a pain. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I carried in the store, too, was also so I could kind of scale things relatively easily. Um, so, like, I wanted to carry bulldozers because I use them a lot, but they're really big. They're kind of, they're, like, one of the most annoying tools to ship um, and ensure that they get there safely. So I, I specialize in smaller stuff. Um, but now that I have somebody helping out uh, full time, we may end up adding more stuff, but it's not a super big priority. I like where the store is at. I'm just looking for those, like, I really want to get, like, a, a, a Detroit Tin Studio squeegee, um, like a main handled squeegee, but for now, the, the hybrid is, like, it's my favorite, man. Maybe, maybe, uh, Tape too, as some people have said. Like you, instead of doing Lowe's tape, you should do Tin Studio tape. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we'll go into that eventually. I got to do a bunch of research, buy something, and you know, that's it's like a, it's, every individual product is its own big expense to kind of scale to. Would be cool to collab in the future sometime. Yeah, like I don't know much about wrapping, so. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Do you do your deposits through your website? Who designs your website? Uh, I unfortunately design my website. I need to have a company to fix it because it, it looks really bad. Like it looks okay, but it's off of like a template and then I made it worse, I think. Um, but I just send people right to this page. So like there's like a lot of text, there's this. So like it, lo it looks okay, um, but it, it could definitely be better. So if you go to here, uh, quote, um, oh wait, no, I'm sorry. So that's a, this is integrated with TintWiz. So if you do one of these forms, then I get a TintWiz inquiry. Um, but I always send people to the deposit page. And then from there, we have a pre-discussed time and date. So you click on book now, then you would click on that date and that time that I talked about. Um, and then they leave a deposit that way. So then they get put on my calendar for that time and then I know what vehicle is coming in. So that helps streamlines a lot of stuff. Well, see, templates look nice and pretty, and then like you feel like you can just make it it's simple. And, and it is drag and drop, so it's relatively simple, but 
it's not as uh, as pretty of a site as I want. That's for sure. I, for, I keep forgetting what their business name is. There's a company that I got to reach out to though. They already talked to me before, but I want them to do my site too. They do really nice work. Problem with merchandise is stacking up on bulk orders, inventory for a single item. Yeah, I feel like every every single item is scaling like its own thing. The only thing that's nice is like, I like what I carry. So like it's, everything kind of fills a little niche too. Um, so when you go to the store, like, and you get a roll of glass aid, you might not buy one of the triages or a couple of them just outright, but when you're going, like, I need glass aid, so I'll get a couple of these things too. Like, there's some complimentary things, um, but yeah, there, that's some of the reasons why I carry some of the other ones. With all the, with the tool stores with like tons of options, when you're new, you don't really know what tools to get necessarily, so it can get really confusing. Um, so I feel like a few of these places should break it down a little better for people, but I guess that's why I have videos. For installers, by installers, yeah, custom niche tools. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and there's some other guys doing it too. It's cool to see. So it helps. All righty, my dudes, um, I got to deliver this car. Um, I think I got to go with my dad's for dinner too. So I'm uh, I'm a I'm a clear out of here. I've got a bunch of appointment schedules for this week too, so we'll have some other streams. Um, I don't know exactly what day, but definitely like Monday or Tuesday. No, oh, today's Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday for sure. I want to build my site soon. It's pricey for a custom site. Thanks for your streaming. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do so much just off of a template. Um, look up Wix. Look up Squarespace. Those are some popular ones. Uh, you see a bunch of like YouTubers advertising stuff like that. They'll, you, you can find lots of, I would, uh, for just starting out, you can do so much off of just a basic template and just get a business site going and then make it look better later on. Like as you, as you're working on it, custom sites or go on Fiverr and, and look at somebody that can, that already has a template and can throw you together. Fiverr is actually a great recommendation too. You'll find people that basically um, have templates that they already work with and they just need the pictures and text and they can throw together a great looking website for you. But they don't have to be super expensive anymore. It's kind of a meme. All righty, guys. I will see you. Have a happy fourth. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. See you Tuesday or Wednesday, I think.